Violin World, written by Tsar Yoshi. Chapter 382 Griffins with Agendas Starlight sat in her familiar spot in the observation room, limbs folded under her body. This time, her book sat idly at her side. The terrain ahead was changing, and she actually had something to look at. The Yule had broadened so much from hundreds of miles of tributaries that it more resembled a slow-moving lake than a river, broad and flat, and still enough she wouldn't have been surprised if she could see the ship's reflection. Yet, rather than widening out into some sort of delta, it was actually thinning, mid-river islands growing less common as the land around it began to rise. They were at the foothills of a mountain range that stretched to the north, with spikes of rock that looked absolutely puny next to the great cliff wall, yet she would hate to walk up, and yet somehow the river had decided to find a way through rather than giving up and emptying into an inland sea. Patchy jungle gave way to a steep black rock, and in a matter of minutes, the ground beneath them had changed completely, and they were over the mountains once again. The mountains cast shadows on each other, framed from behind by the setting sun, and starlight watched as some slopes were bathed in gold, and others, cut by jagged lines of shadow, lit peaks growing rarer and rarer as they progressed. Directly below, the Yule zigzagged, sharply rounding whatever corners it took to find a way through the maze of stone, and then she felt a hoof on her shoulder and breath against her ears. Starlight, look forward, Maple quietly urged. Starlight did, and her eyes widened. Apparently, this mountain range had no depth to it at all. A few more peaks, and it ended. And when it did, there was nothing beyond. Or there was, she realized as they drew closer to the edge. The mountains were preceded by a flat, featureless, gray-blue plain that looked like the sky and had nothing interesting to it whatsoever aside from a shimmery texture on the surface. The sea. Starley swallowed. She had seen large bodies of water before, but always, as a rule, there had been something on the other side. The ocean was walled off to the south by the never-ending equestrian mountain wall, waterfall outlets pouring directly into the sea, and a vision directly to the east was ended by the rain shadow of a wall of storm clouds, but to the north and northeast, her vision simply faded into the distance, and the ocean and sky met in a hazy, indistinct line. I always imagined what it would look like, Mabel murmured from Starlight's side. I saw pictures, but seeing it in person, is this as impressive to you as it is to me? The last few mountain peaks fell away, and the river met the ocean at a southward angle, the mouth partially protected by a rocky spur that would make it very hard to notice sailing in from the north. A giant green flag had been erected on a sturdy base near the intersection, advertising its presence to any who still sailed that waterway, as it had likely been doing for countless years. Where the two waters mixed, Starlight realized the water was a slightly different color from the sea. They blended in a plume that swirled thickly all around the sheer, wave-buffeted shoreline. Look! Look backwards! Maple suddenly said, craning her neck far around to see what was under and behind them. There are two giant ponies carved into the mountains on either side of the river! Starlight barely caught a glance before they were gone. Huh, she said, feeling like Maple wanted a conversation, but without anything that needed to be said. Maple didn't seem to mind, settling in beside her to drink in her fill of the sight of endless water. No, Valet shuffled into the bridge, doing her level best to look lazy, drowsy, and bored, uh, which wasn't hard at all when naps were her sole entertainment method and sleeping too much eventually sapped one's energy instead of adding to it. Someone said something about holding my cute butt up here tonight? That would be me, the soundstone chirped, Shine Sparks, Slipstream, and Gerardo all standing by for the evening changing of ships. Flay! Someone said you needed to hear my voice. Amber? Flay blinked. Hey, uh... 
going? Gerardo cleared his throat, preparing for an epic bout of narration. When she called this morning, Miss Amber was quite concerned by reports of us going to a locale where your species is reportedly undervalued. She believed you might be taking it poorly and wished to give what she described as a pep talk. Personally, I find it quite a generous offer, though would advise you to get a room if it becomes at all necessary. Valet blinked. Yeah, we might have to do that. And I'm dealing with it. Like, sorry, I just woke up. Not thinking of anything witty to say right now. That's okay, Amber consoled. I did some pestering and got some input from someone who knows way more about this than me. And also wanted to talk to you in the first place. Glizette? There was a funk and a tapping, and then another voice came in. Nice, so, you all are my elusive new neighbors, or so I've heard. My apologies about that, Gerardo quickly assured. It was never our intent to project that we were meaning to stay in Iron Range long term. Don't sweat it, I've got other social circles. Though I am ticked at you. When your neighbors are all either dead or insane, is it really wrong to want a little more? But, like I said, whatever. So, apparently you're having Sorosian woes about the Empire and don't know exactly what to expect? Valet glanced at herself, checking both wings. Bad ponies? That's me. Something, something heresy and don't like your goddess? Yeah, something like that. If you're trying to stay safe and out of the spotlight... Uh, Glizette hesitated. Here's the situation as best as I know it. You guys look weird, act weird, stick to yourselves and refuse to worship our goddess, so a lot of devout griffins and ponies feel offended by you. Garshiva doesn't, either because she has a thick skin, knows better than to go looking for trouble, or both. But no one knows for sure. What she specifically says you can't do is try to steal the Sorosians' land, or try to stop them from setting up their weird statues wherever they feel like. In general, though, she lets their subjects make their own laws, and only weighs in as a judge in extreme cases. That's bad news for you, because the noble houses all do what they want, and everyone in power in their lands who doesn't expressly want to challenge them is going to be sucking up to them hard, since they have no backbones and just want to get ahead. Cowards, if you ask me. Valet glanced away. So, how bad are we talking? Goons jumping me in the streets and stuff? Glizzard dodged a question, continuing. The best news I can give you is that both High Prince Gazelle and Crown Princess Gwendolyn like Sorosians and have committed themselves to your cause and all that. That doesn't actually mean much because the last Empress is dead and Lin isn't old enough to formally take the throne and Gazelle hasn't started his own house yet so both of their powers are completely symbolic. But Lin eventually will grow up and Gazelle is already known as a skilled and charismatic leader so some of the lords will be trying to stay on their good side already to be in favor when she does take the throne. Of course, mothers want to do that to push their agendas. Uh, politics, you know. Lin will someday take a husband, and it will be up to the two of them to see if they can bring unity to the houses after these last few years of leaderless doing whatever. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Anyway, I don't know every house's opinions or positions on this, but there are bound to be at least some who wholeheartedly support a prince and princess, either for their own reasons or because they think they're the winning team to back. Your absolute best case scenario is if Gazelle leaves the Imperial family and starts his own house, but aside from that, you'll want to look around, figure out who's saying what, and then try to stick to the territories of lords who are favorable to you. I don't know whether their opinions will trickle down to street level, but as long as you stick to respectable company in those places, yeah, you should be pretty much fine. Yeah. Blaine nodded, Gazelle's name ringing in her ear as the recipient of Kiro's mysterious package. Her brain quickly started turning. Gazelle was a supporter of Bad Ponies, but Kiro had taken a job to capture her or wipe her out, meaning it was slightly more likely they were enemies and the package was meant to damage the prince, so they shouldn't deliver it if they wanted his help. Good to know. Anything else? Like stuff I should do as opposed to just where I should stay? No advice anyone else can give you. Make friends and be nice to others, since a lot of times a good example or real relationship can help overcome prejudice. It'll help if ponies and griffins see you respecting Garshiva too. Might as well try to get in good with the other Sarosians too. I'm the ambassador to Iron Ridge, not the Misty Mountains, so I don't know what the culture is like, but maybe they like you if you went up there. This is the first time I've ever talked to a Sorosian, let alone given advice in a way longer than I care to remember here. Thanks anyway, Glazette, Amber broke in. 
try to raise the talent. Indeed, we appreciate your expertise, and while it sounds as though we'll need to watch our back slightly more than I had hoped, we do at least have a strategy. Find those in power we could get in good with, then spend our days in their lands and keep our profiles low any time we are elsewhere. Quite a superior plan to walking in blind and hoping for the best. Hey, did you say anything about Caro? Valley interrupted. Real quick? What, that narcissist? Glizette's voice returned. Yeah, I don't have much to say about him now. You saw how he decorated this place. Invited me in once, and I took one look at all the self-portraits and got out as fast as I could. Converser, a fine wine, classical music, and himself, himself, himself. Yeah, from what I got it, he wasn't very interesting. Hmm. Gerardo scratched his chin. Either way, I have to go. Hurry up and get to the Empire so you can tell them to send in ships with fresh equipment to get these stuck ships out of here so my job can be relaxing for once, Glazette urged. And good luck. And come back and be actual neighbors someday. Here's Amber back. Before anyone else in the room could reply, Valet snapped up the soundstone with her tail and slipped it under her head, right between her ears. I think I'll do just that, thank you very much, she happily announced, strolling out of the room. End of chapter 382